The deep woods hold all kinds of mysteries, and we are no stranger to that here in the swamp. We've seen crimes that we cannot even fathom. We've seen mysteries that nobody can seemingly answer. And we've also heard of the most strange and unsettling creatures that just are not of this world. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you are new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true deep woods horror stories that will freak you out tonight. Some of these stories are verifiable on your own, and others are alleged to be true. But nonetheless, these stories are downright terrifying. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. You never know what the future is going to hold. With the economy being a challenge as always, you never know how that's going to affect your business, especially that of a small business owner like myself. If you have a small business and the economy might be a little scary right now, and you're not sure how you're going to ship your things out in a nice, clean, and streamlined way, I got you covered. ShipStation is how I do everything on that end. When it comes to saving money as a small business owner, every little bit helps. ShipStation gives you access to discounts of up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates, and you can manage every order from one simple to use dashboard. Now, ShipStation is truly awesome because they offer a free trial and even a quick setup. So you're spending as little time as possible on the learning curve and maximizing the time you can, making the best of your business. So what are you waiting for? Join me and many others in the swamp today who are using ShipStation to effortlessly integrate their workspace into their shipping. Worry less about the bottom line when you save money with ShipStation. Go to ShipStation.com and use code SWAMPED today and sign up for your free 60-day trial. That's ShipStation.com code swamped crow country weirdness by connor p i grew up spending the summers in montana and i still make it out there when possible something that's been drawing a lot of national attention lately is the disappearance of native women especially in crow country which expands far beyond the reaches of the actual Crow Indian Reservation. I first started hearing about these disappearances back in 2014, but every year, there are somehow hundreds of newly missing person cases reported in the region. Much of my family still lives in Montana, and is plugged in with the local basketball community. If you don't know, high school basketball is extremely popular in Montana and many teams spend a lot of time traveling to and from games. My cousin recently spoke with someone who wished to remain anonymous from the Hardin basketball team. Hardin, Montana is on the border of the Crow Indian Reservation and that's where a lot of disappearances seem to happen. The following is from my cousin's telling of his native friend's account. We were on the bus traveling to Billings, Montana for an away game. We played a good game, but we lost 28 to 24 ultimately. We were on the bus back home to Hardin when we saw something running alongside the bus. It was dark, so I couldn't tell what it was, but I figured it was a stray dog or a coyote. When we got back to the high school and I was getting into my truck when I saw something run out from behind the bus. There were still a few girls waiting to get picked up by their parents, so I grabbed my Ruger Blackhawk revolver from the glove compartment in a mag flashlight and started strolling to where I had seen the movement. I turned on the flashlight and looked around. I couldn't see anything at first, so I went back to my truck. The last girl's parents picked her up and I turned on my truck. The high school backs up to some space off of North Mitchell Road, which I must take to get off home. It's nothing but trees in that area, it's basically just woods. I was flipping through radio stations to get the forecast because it was supposed to snow later that night. I happened to glance up and saw something running behind my truck in the rearview mirror. I quietly cussed myself before going to a gradual stop. Once again, I grabbed my revolver and flashlight and started to open the door when something slammed into the outside of the door effectively boxing me in. What I saw next was the stuff of nightmares. A face was pressed up against my driver's side window, but it wasn't the face of a human or any animal I knew of. It had dark, short hair, 
big yellow eyes, and tiny black pupils. It had tall, pointy ears on the top of its head and long, sharp teeth hanging out from its mouth. Th these teeth, they were shaped oddly, though, almost like shark teeth. Its snout almost reminded me that of a baboon. It was breathing on the window, causing it to fog up immensely. I was honestly stuck in a state of shock, and for just a moment, I forgot that I was holding the revolver. Almost as soon as I did, I could see the eyes shift from looking down at the gun and then back up to me. What happened next sends shivers down my spine, even retelling it. Its mouth twisted up in a cruel, gruesome smile. Before I could even raise my hand, it leapt back, ran away from the truck, and that's when I got a good look at the rest of its body. It was very tall, but it resembled that of a large dog of sorts with a thick, dark mane mixed with the body of a human. It had wide, muscular shoulders like a football player and arms that hung down way past its knees with knuckles that seemingly grat. With its knuckles touching the ground, it appeared to be crouching down, but even in the position it was in, it was still almost eye level with me in my cab of my Ford F-150. I was fearful that it might lunge at the truck again, so I shifted it into drive and began pulling forward. Instead of slamming back into the door, it jumped high into the air and landed on top of my truck denting the roof, before jumping off the other side and running off into the night. I swear I almost had a heart attack and crapped myself right there. I drove home the long way, frequently checking my mirrors to ensure it was not following me. His experience has left me extremely concerned for the safety of the people in my community. I can't help but wonder if that was a demon, or some sort of dogman, or something else. Maybe that's what's making these young women disappear. I'm sure that might be a stretch, but you never know. Deathly Hiking Trail by Anonymous to be truthful with you, Mr. Swamp Dweller, I have always loved hiking in the woods. The sound of crunching leaves and the scent of pine needles underfoot was one of my favorite things in the world. So, when I found myself on an unmarked trail, deep in the heart of the forest in a state park that I have gone to every single day of my life for the past two years, I was overjoyed. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and I was in my element. As I walked deeper into the woods, the light began to fade and the trees grew closer together. I found myself in a dark, dense thicket of underbrush, and I had only then realized I had lost my way. Suddenly, almost as if I'm in some sort of cliché horror movie, I heard a weird noise. It was strange, and it was an unearthly sound. But what made it even weirder was it wasn't coming from above or from around me. It was coming from underground. At first, I really did try to ignore it, telling myself it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. But the noise grew louder and more persistent, and I knew it was real. It was as if something was scraping against the earth, trying to claw its way to the surface. As I continued to walk, the noise grew louder and more insistent, until it was impossible to ignore. I could feel it in my body, as if it was making my heart pound even harder. I began to feel an overwhelming sense of dread come over me. My body was feeling tingly and strange. I knew I should turn back and head for the safety of my car, but my curiosity got the best of me, and like I said, I had no idea where the heck I was. For whatever reason, I followed the noise, which led me to a small clearing in the woods. In the center of the clearing was a small hole, about the size of a dinner plate. The noise was coming from the inside and I couldn't help but lean in closer to try to hear it better. And that's when I saw it. Something was moving inside the hall. Something dark and writhing, like a mass of black tentacles. It was as if the earth itself was alive and trying to swallow me whole. I stumbled back in horror, and the noise grew more loud and more frantic. I turned to run, but the forest had grown dark and twisted around me. The trees seemed to be closing in, blocking my path and trapping me in a maze of gnarled roots and twisted vines. I was clearly freaking out and having a panic attack. The noise grew louder still and I could hear something chasing me through the underbrush at this point. 
I just felt that my life was in my hands at this point, and if I did not run as fast as I could, I would be dead. My heart was pounding in my chest, my breath was coming in short gasp. At any moment I was scared that I would feel something hot and fetid breathing down my neck, and I knew that if I didn't escape now, it would be my end. After what felt like a miracle, I finally burst through the trees and stumbled out onto the road. I looked back, but the forest was oddly silent and still. Whatever had been chasing me was gone, and I was once again alone. But I knew that the woods would never be the same again. I knew that my love for hiking would never be there. Something dark and sinister was lurking beneath the earth, waiting to drag me down into the depth of its domain, and I knew that I could never, ever go back there, not if I wanted to keep my sanity intact. Hi Swamp Dweller, I've been listening to your stories for about a month now, and I want to say you are my favorite narrator I have encountered thus far. I always think the stories you tell are fascinating and they've got me thinking about things that I experienced myself. I am 18 years old and I live in the Netherlands, so do not expect a Bigfoot, Dogman, or any kind of cryptid story. The forests here are just way too small and the population density is too high to have such creatures lurking about in the woods. But, as probably many of you know, that does not mean that weird things do not occur. With that having been said, let me tell my two stories that still make me ponder sometimes. When I was about 13 or 14 years old, a new kid joined my class and became a member of my group of friends who I still see regularly. I will call him Brent to make things easier. Brent lives at the border of the biggest patch of woods in the vicinity of my house, which has an area of about 35 square kilometers, or 13.6 squared miles for the American folk. His family has a respectable piece of land for Dutch standards, and has an extra building on the land which is used for office and guest stuff. Next to his land was an abandoned property, which consisted of four small buildings, of which two were inaccessible. Well, Brent, my friends, and I, being young teens, often went to this property and hung about the place, smashing windows and blowing up toilets and other stuff with fireworks. This eventually grew out to us having a sleepover in the guest house about once a year, during which we would wait until midnight to venture out into those woods. The abandoned property, other towns or sometimes all of them until the sun came up. We would occasionally build and throw Molotov cocktails in the concrete shed of the abandoned property, set off heavy fireworks, and one time even blew up 15 liters of lighter fluid on the sandy plains of the woods. These woods were mainly coniferous, and, for whatever reason, sometimes had these sandy plains ranging from small to huge within them. We liked one plain because it was about three miles away from the house, and sand doesn't burn so we were confident enough to set up fireworks there and not cause a forest fire. This annual night got a name, which roughly translate to Chaos Night. Childish, I know. One chaos night, there were only three of us because the rest of the boys had family things to attend to, because it was roughly around Christmas and New Year's Eve. That night was freezing cold, and we went out to walk to the sandy plain in the woods about 5 a.m. I remember it being so cold that the light yellow sand at the plain was frozen and glistening under the sky. During the walk there, however, something strange happened. We were walking single file. Brent in the middle, another friend called Steve in the front, and me in the back. When we were almost at our destination, whilst we were talking, I heard the whispers or mumble of a woman, just about three to five yards away, directly to my right. Brent and I stopped dead in our tracks because we have never heard something like that before. Brent often walks his dogs in the late evenings through those woods, and I have had enough adventures out here with my grandpa at night in the forest to know the common sounds of the Dutch critters as well. Steve has trouble hearing higher pitched sounds and was a bit further away from where the sound came from, so he didn't notice it. But Brent spun around and we both looked at each other confirming that we both heard it. We stood there for a bit, told Steve what we were hearing, and I shined my flashlight in the direction of the sound but never saw anything. This made us shrug it off and continue our little adventure. This might not sound scary at all, 
but you have to take some facts into consideration. Animals of the woods are extremely shy here, and will run off if they hear you coming, and we were plenty loud. Also, the other animals that would be active on the ground at that time, and maybe would let us come that close would be a moose, or maybe a rat or something. But I can assure you this, this sounded way too human. Brent even agrees with me that it sounded like a woman. So, either there was someone hiding from us, or it was something else entirely. The thought of my experience and what it could have been still gives me chills to think about, especially now that I'm a firm believer of the unknown. My second story takes place at Brent's house. This was after our first night of chaos. My friends and I went out to the abandoned property to throw Molotovs again, because the night before was our first time doing a thing like that, and let's just say, a lot of the Molotovs failed. Earlier, I said that we would throw the mollies in a concrete shed for safety reasons. Yes, we were scoundrels, and pretty stupid one. The shed was placed about 10 meters away from the other three buildings that were built in a sort of circle. So, during the night, we had not gone to the three main buildings because the shed was the first thing you would encounter from the way that we had to come. Therefore, we discovered weird symbols painted in red all over the walls of the three main buildings the day after. There certainly was a theme going on because most of them depicted a triangle with an eye that shed a tear in it. The other symbols that were there kind of reminded me of those patterns in cornfields. Me and a friend, Vincent, went into the only main small house which was the only building besides the shed that was accessible. The rest had collapsed some years prior. We noticed that some furniture had been moved around, rather recently, and we were now able to climb up to the attic. Like I said, it was a small house, so we did just that. Vincent went first, and I followed. He found like this casing that you put on the ceiling to cover up your light bulb. I do not know what it is called, but it resembled a globe and it was white. He was also showing it to the rest of my friends through the broken window while jokingly shouting, I found the eye of the Illuminati, referring to the triangle eye symbols outside. While he was doing this, for some reason, I had to take a pee, so I went pee into this hole that was going into the ground. When I was done, I walked further into the attic, which consisted of two rooms, one in the front in which we entered and where Vincent found that weird eye thing. The room in the back was dark and only had one tiny window that was about 8 inches by 8 inches. To my surprise, there was this little filthy window there, also, that resembled an eye within a triangle painted in red. When my eyes adjusted to the dark, I saw that there was a circle painted on the floor with small candles on the outline of it. In the middle of the circle was a self-made morning star on the ground. For those of you who do not know what a morning star is, it is a medieval weapon which consists of a handle with a chain on the far end of it and a ball with spikes protruding out of it. I picked up the weapon and brought it to the window where Vincent was still talking with my friends outside and immediately after I stuck my hand out of the window to show it to everybody, Vincent threw the eye high up in the air and it landed literally on one of the rocks, breaking it into a thousand pieces. Vincent's comedy act caused me and the boys to laugh and therefore we weren't that impressed by all of it. Sure, we were perplexed that something like that would even be there, but not necessarily terrified. After that we threw some mollies and took the Morning Star back to Brent's house where he stashed it somewhere. That abandoned property has since been demolished and other people have built their houses there and the Morning Star should still be somewhere in Brent's house, although I haven't seen it since that day. We still go into those woods at night sometimes, and we've had a couple of weird things happen again. If someone wants to know more or even see some pictures of the Morning Star and symbols, maybe I can send them in. Although these stories may not seem scary on their own, together these experiences creep the hell out of me, and often make me wonder what was in those woods that night, and who left that Morning Star there, and why. If someone has a clue, please leave it in the comments. Thank you for listening, and stay safe. Hi Swamp Dweller, I don't know if you'd be interested in a story from England. It's kind of long-winded, but it's a weird and scary experience that me and my partner will never forget. To set the scene, we live in a busy city in the South Midlands of England. We have a bully breed dog and take him out for walks in the surrounding parks and woods quite often. I'm quite into the paranormal, 
and have experienced lots of things. My mom is a spiritual medium, so I guess it comes with the territory. My partner, however, is a science graduate and is a very everything-has-an-explanation sort of person. Anyway, on this day, we decided to go to a popular picnic park just on the outskirts of the city. It's almost always full of families, dog walkers, and picnickers. It was late spring, and the temperature was just starting to hit summer heat. It was a sunny day, not a cloud in the sky, and no wind. The park was full of the usual, parents and kids with their families and dogs, old couples going for walks and the like. Here in England, bully breeds are still quite stigmatized and feared, so we usually avoid going where there are lots of people. Not that our dog is dangerous or anything, he's just overly friendly, and people freak out when he trots up to greet them. So we decided to go off the beaten track. To give you a rough idea, the park has a small lake in the center, with paths and benches that surround it. Just off one of those paths are a few farmer's fields in a thick wooded area which snakes around into another path which eventually leads back to the park. We decided to go through the cattle gate, which leads up through the farmer's fields. It was so hot and beautiful that day that nothing spooky or creepy even crossed our minds. Even though you could no longer see anyone, you could still hear kids playing and dogs barking in the distance. As we came up to the wooded area, whilst still on the dirt path alongside it, I noticed a man walking through the thick brush. I thought it was weird because he was coming from the opposite end of the woods which literally leads to nothing. No houses or roads or anything of the likes. Just endless fields and woods. I just told myself, oh, he must be looking for his dog or something. My partner noticed him too, and we shared a look to each other like, what a weirdo, and carried on walking. But I couldn't help but look at him. He looked so strange. It must have been close to 30 degrees and he was in a thick black hoodie, black trousers, or sweats. He had longish dirty blonde hair, and maybe around our age, so mid-twenties. But what was more strange is he had a dazed sort of smile on his face and his head kind of tilted to one side. When he walked, he swayed from side to side slightly. I tried to push it to the back of my mind telling myself that he was just a stoner or something looking for his dog. He wasn't calling or making noises to get a dog's attention or anything, which was even more strange to me. Anyway, I kept looking back over my shoulder. He was in the brush for a little while longer but then joined the path we were on and began walking our way. He must have been about 30 feet behind us. I noticed how tall he was now that we were on the same path and how broad he was. He must have been about 6 foot 9 closer to seven. He was huge, maybe 17 or 18 stone, so something like 240 to 250 pounds more or less. Around this point, we noticed everything was silent. There were no kids laughing, no indistinctive family chatter, no dogs barking, no birds tweeting, nothing. The only sound that I could discern was the sound of our footsteps in the wind, but there was no wind. It was roasting hot, not even a slight breeze yet, we could hear wind blowing through the trees. Even though the sun was beating down, it felt darker somehow. Like everything was, I don't know, desaturated. My partner started to freak out and strangely so did our dog. Now this really struck me as weird. Our boy's the kind of dog who would greet anyone, run up to them to play. But no, he wouldn't even look back at me or the man. My partner and dog started to speed up to get away from the wooded area. This weird behemoth of a man was in. I really started to freak out myself, but don't want to upset my partner even further. So I kept my cool, quiet, and kept my pace. I looked over my shoulder again and he was closer, maybe 25 feet away. Now for a bit of context, as you exit the wooded area you come to a path which is surrounded on either side with tall thick bushes and it curves around widely to lead you back to the main park. The curve is so wide that you can see far ahead, but you can only see the bushes where it curves. Neither of the exits are in view. As we reach this path, I check again, and the guy is closer still. It's still silent. All I can hear is the faint wind sounds in our footsteps, but nothing from the man. He's smiling still in that dazed sort of way, and still is kind of swaying. 
Everything still felt weird and dull, and that's the only way I can describe it. I thought to myself, if this weird bloke is going to try something, I'm going to have to protect my partner. I'm only 5'8 myself, and not much of a fighter, so I grabbed my car keys and put them between my fingers in my pocket. If this dude wanted to try anything, I'd smash him in the face and leg it. I'm not fast either, but I convinced myself I'd be faster than him. I check over my shoulder again and he is still close. I start to hype myself up. He was coming, and I was ready. I realized I couldn't hear him at all though. He was probably about 15 feet behind me now. My partner and dog had literally hightailed it up the path, but why couldn't I hear any footsteps from him? Another quick glance and he was right behind me, five feet or so. This was it. If I was going to do anything, it had to be now. If I could keep the element of surprise on my side, I might be able to stand a chance and give us the opportunity to run. I swung around as quick as I could and went to shout out at him and swipe at him, but he was gone. There was nothing there, no man or no sign of him whatsoever. I paused and looked around. He couldn't have run back along the path. He couldn't be that quick. I would still be able to see him as the path winds around so widely he would still be in view. He couldn't have jumped through either side of the path into the rows of bushes as I would have heard it and seen the rustling of the bushes or the hole he would have made. He had simply vanished. I stayed there for a moment and only when I decided to walk on to check on my other half and the dog that I realized I could hear the park again. The wind noises had gone and the day returned to normal. The sunlight was no longer dull and everything seemed normal. I got shivers and ran to catch up. I asked my partner if they had seen him go anywhere but they didn't see anything. They just said he really freaked them out and they didn't want to be there anymore. I could see that they were really shaken up. The dog was back to normal though, wagging his tail and wanting to play and explore. We decided to cut our walk short and drive home. After we got home, I rang my mom and told her all about it. She advised me to check reports for missing people or deaths related to that area, which I did and weirdly enough, Lots of people have died there by suicide or overdoses, but none of the people I found online matched this description. I tried to forget about it and get back to normal life and all that. I was applying to go back to college at the time, so I didn't really need to be thinking about giant ghost men. After a few days, it had left our minds and we got back to normality. A few nights later, I wake up in the middle of the night and open my eyes. As they adjust to our darkness, I look up at the ceiling where the orange glow of the street lamp shines through our window, and my heart stops. He was there, stood over our bed. He was so tall with his head just below the ceiling light. He still had that weird, dazed smile all lit up with the orange glow. I jump up and punch at him as hard as I can, but my fist doesn't meet anything, because there was nothing there. I turned on the light and looked around, found nothing. I absolutely ransacked the house and found not a single person. I've never seen him since, but after seeing him in our bedroom, our apartment felt horrid afterwards. It never felt homey or safe again, and we would hear horrible things. For example, at one point in the middle of the night I heard my own voice call my partner's name from the other side of our bedroom. We heard walking in our attic, which was too low for people to walk in, and our pets would not sleep alone. They would always growl at corners of the house. We left that flat after a year or so of dealing with the weird ghostly experiences. My partner, of course, kept denying that it was a ghost. She just said that it couldn't be explained. Hello, Swamp Dweller. I've sent in a few stories in the past, going under a different alias. Speaking about my creepy experience with camping a few years ago. But around a week ago, I had another very strange thing happen to me. I'm 14 years old and from Belfast, Ireland. I go out a lot on nighttime walks with my friends, and most nights we only go on short ones. But this night we planned on doing something else. I met my friend on her street, and then we went and picked up my other friend. For the story, I'll call one Katie and the other one Ellie. We walked to the bus stop closest to my friend's street and got a bus to the university area of my city. As there are lots of cafes and restaurants around there, and it's quite bright. We got off the bus at the stop and started walking, looking for a cafe to go into, but we couldn't find one, so we decided to walk straight into the city center, which was a short walk away. 
We found an open cafe and decided to go in for a snack and something to drink. It was around 7 p.m. and it was getting dark outside. So we decided to leave the cafe and get another bus back home. We got on the bus that would take all three of us home. But at the second stop, a ticket inspector got on and kicked us off the bus when he realized we had no tickets. It was now raining slightly. We decided we would just walk to another bus stop and get on a bus that we knew would be inspector free. We walked around five minutes to get to that bus stop, and when we got there, there wasn't another one around for about 20 minutes. Damn it, let's just take the other bus to the field and then walk through it to get home, I said to both of my friends. They agreed, so we hopped on the bus and took a seat. On the bus ride back, it started to rain even heavier. When we got to the last stop, we were the last ones on the bus, and the stop happened to be in a very Protestant area. So, we already felt quite unsafe being there as two out of three of us had very unique Catholic names and were afraid of some people hearing them and potentially harming us. I know it might sound a little weird to mention this, but unfortunately it is a true issue in the area we grew up in. We walked through some streets and finally got to the football field that backed onto the forest that we would need to cut through to get home. We sprinted across the football field, trying not to get our shoes too wet as it had been raining for a few days and the field happened to be quite flooded. We got to the edge of the forest, and when the rain got a little bit heavier than it was before, the forest was pitch black, so we turned on our flashlights to see where we were going. We began our walk into the forest, taking careful steps as to not slip on the wet, muddy ground. Now I spent my whole summer in that forest, and I would be confident in saying that I knew it like the back of my hand. All three of us do. When you walk in, there's a straight path that leads you through two small fence posts, after walking for about two minutes. When you get past those fence posts, you take a right and walk for about two minutes. Then you arrive at the other side of the forest, where you exit into a huge field, which then leads you home. Although when we took a right at the two tall fence posts, it didn't lead us there at all. The whole forest changed shape. We had been walking down this path for around five minutes now, and the rain was so loud we could hardly hear each other. This was when we started to panic. We were running around now, trying desperately to find the way out of this place. We walked up a small hill to a big tree, a tree that we had never seen before, a tree that was not there before, ever. I looked around to see my friend Katie as pale as I had ever seen her before. What do we do now? She screamed. I shouted back to her that I didn't know. Then her flashlight flickered, an iPhone flashlight. Phone flashlights never do that. Then, mine went out. I started to panic as it was now so dark you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. Then, just after that happened, my friend Katie got a call from my friend Ellie's twin sister, who happened to not be there that night. Katie spoke to her in a panic, but this only lasted a few seconds as her phone randomly hung up on her. Out of the blue, it hung up all by itself and died. Weird. It was fully charged. We continued our walkthrough, still trying to find our way back. After taking multiple turns that we had never seen before, we finally reached the clearing that we had been looking for. It felt like hours of walking, and there's no telling how long it actually took. We stopped for a minute or two to calm down, when from behind us, I heard twigs cracking, almost as if there was someone walking in circles around us. I told my friends we had to leave immediately, trying not to panic them. We got to the bottom of the field we had ended up in, and I checked the time. It was 8.45, but we arrived at the start of the forest at 8.39. There is not a chance in hell that that whole thing only lasted for five minutes. It felt like all three of us had been there for an hour minimum, but it was only five or six minutes. I got home and couldn't stop shaking the entire night. What just happened? Why did it feel like such a long time? Why did the flashlights flicker and then go out? Why did the forest change shape completely? Why did my friend's phone hang up? And lastly, why did I hear someone circling us in the clearing? We have all agreed to never go there in the dark, unless we are with a large group of people. If anyone has any idea what this could have been, or what we could have experienced, please feel free to inform us in the comments down below. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true deep woods horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. 
As always, if you enjoyed these stories, be sure to slap box that like button to make sure it really feels it. It helps the channel grow a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it. If you're new, why not join us? Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications as I upload videos almost every single day on all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube Premium and still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you go, absolutely free of charge, you can do so from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, Google Podcasts, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. As always, thank you guys so, so much for supporting the Swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this on a daily basis without you guys. In the comments down below, definitely let me know what story was your favorite tonight. I'd love to know, it helps me pick out better stories in the future. If you made it all the way to the end, tonight's code word is glowing skull. I'd love to see what funny comments you can come up with, and it's always cool to see how many of you make it to the very end. Thank you guys as always, and I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.